And we sit here, just relax the body. And relax this body. Let go of all the tightness, the tension. Keep it relaxed, keep it peaceful. And keep the mind open, calm. Don't let the mind run here and there. But just bring the mind back to the body, the center. May I be free. May I be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental the suffering. Free from all, all physical suffering. May I be peaceful. And be peaceful. May I be well. And may I truly be happy. May I be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental suffering. Free from all physical suffering. May I be peaceful. May I be well. And may I truly be happy. Now let us expand this meta. Expand this meta, reaching out to all the people, humans or non-humans around us. The monks here, fellow yogis, helpers, volunteers, devotees, supporters to around your house your apartment your condo to your loved ones around neighbors and also to all the guardian devas of this center of your place and all other devas residing nearby to all the petas. To unfortunate beings and to all, all the and to all the animals, big or small, far or near, seen or unseen. May all of us here be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental suffering. Free from all physical suffering. May all of us be peaceful, be well, and, and truly be happy.
May all of us be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental suffering. Free from all physical suffering. All of us be peaceful, be well, and truly be happy. Let us spread the meter, spreading out further to all things. To all the beings, to all the beings in this world. Whether they are our loved ones near or far away. Our friends, family, relatives. To all the people whom we do not know wherever they are. And even to those whom we dislike or those who dislike us. Without exception, spread the metta to all of them. To all the guardian devas of the sasana. To all other devas in this world. Uh, to all the petas, the unfortunate beings, and to all the animals, big or small, far or near, seen or unseen. May all beings in this world be free from all kinds of harm and danger, free from all mental suffering, free from all physical suffering, May all beings in this world be able to live in peace and not in war. Live with kindness and compassion and not in cruelty or violence. May all beings in this world be peaceful. May they all truly be happy. May all beings in this world be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental suffering. Free from all physical suffering. May all beings in this world be peaceful. Be well. And truly be happy.
Let us spread the metta, reaching out to all beings, wherever they are, whatever they are. All the beings from the highest planes of existence down to the lowest planes of existence. May all things, without exception, be free from all kinds of harm and danger. Free from all mental suffering. Free from all physical suffering. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be well. May all beings without exception. May they all truly be happy. May all beings without exception. May they all be peaceful. Be well. And truly be happy. Okay, now slowly we let go of the meta. We bring the mind back to the center again, to the body. Feel the sensation. Feel the rise and fall of the abdomen. Feel the breath. Feel the touch. And then we can slowly open our eyes. All right. Today, the um, today this talk, I've been thinking about it for a while. But it's not as obvious as, as the, what the title says. So here, the topic here is whether the new normal, I said no. Physically, yes. What is deeper than that is no. Because whether it is built the same way occurrence of our mind. But through this time, uh, hold on everybody, the internet sometimes over here is a little bit unstable. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's a bit more. <laughs> I can see that the speed is not very fast right now. So your the quality of the uh, video, it could be a little bit uh, not not that good. It wouldn't be that good because over here, our signal sometimes is a bit erratic over here. I'm using just a 4G. In there. Our Wi-Fi is even more slower than than my 4G. So anyway, so here we are going through all these uh, lockdowns or MCO or CMCO, whichever name you are call it. Yeah. Then we are adopting to a new. Uh, ways of behavior, 
you know, that you all have to like line up one meter or two meters apart. You got to wear, you got to do this, do that. Cannot do this, cannot do that. You know, where there's so many, so many things we have to adopt. So, uh, usually, all all these things we call it the new normal. Yes, physically, I do not need deny that. No, our lives change in one way or another you know, at this time. I'm not going to talk about that. Those things are for me. Even I have not been to the town for the past three months. <laughs> for the past three months, but the town is just about five kilometers away. <laughs> I've not been there. I've not been to the town. So I do not know what is really going on outside there, except reading from the news. But what I've, what I've seen is only from the internet or Facebook or, or, or some news. I don't know, in the sense of I do not know good feeling because I don't have to go out. I don't have to go out. I got nothing for me to go out. So, but the thing is that now, whether we are in this stage of time, wherever you are in the world, and then we are going through some difficulty, um, some kind of uh, anxiety also for some people, and for some people, you know, they lost their jobs too. You know, and many going to be or lost their jobs. But on on the other hand, on this time of this time this time of time, there'll be some people who are going to earn a lot, like what we are using over here. They are Zoom, you see. They they smile all the way to the bank. They use the Facebook. They smile all the way to the bank because more and more people is going to use those things at this moment of time. Yeah. So during this time, yeah, so during this time, a lot of people suffer, and yet there are some people who benefit from it, uh, whether it's uh, financially and so on. Yeah. So this is not the area I would like to talk about because this is too many things for, for me to talk. I would like to talk about something more normal is behind behind it at the undercurrent of it and how we're going to look at those things that how it pulls us whether we are in the lockdown quarantine or whether we are free from it later on or before that we're going to see what are they and see how we can identify them and we can able to reduce them and finally cut them off so tonight here, uh, tonight, <laughs> this morning here, uh, this morning here, I will, I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about something what we call the Buddhist called asawa, a s a v a. Uh, I'm going to talk about asawa. Uh, now, this word asawa here is not easy for us to translate. Uh. Now let me let me let me sh see whether I can. Sh share some screen with you or not. Uh, what is important here that uh, the word, word asawa here is something is sometimes is not normally we talk about, but they run deep in our lives. Uh, not only deep in our life, they run and they they'll follow you from life after life. And they'll follow you before all the lives before you come and right now and you're going to follow you into the future. If you don't see it, then we don't we don't, we're not able to, for us to to understand it. Yeah. What what is important here is that now this the word asawa, when it's translated into English, it kind of lost its meaning. Uh, it lost its meaning. The uh, um, the word asawa, when it translated to English, sometimes they translate as tains, you know, tains, T A I N T S, tains, tainted, you know, something like that. Or sometimes it's translated as uh, cankers, <laughs> sometimes it's translated as influxes, some they 
translate as affluence. Uh, uh, some some translator translate it as fermentations. Some just translate it as defilement. Yeah. Which I find that fermentation and defilements are uh, they are not so easily for us to understand. The defilements usually we look for kilesa and it's a much more wider scope. Uh. Whereas asawa, it's difficult to translate, just like the word dukkha, you know. The word dukkha also is not easy to translate. If you translate it as just suffering, it just only capture part of the meaning only. There are another deeper part of the meaning of dukkha, you cannot capture it. So if you use the word suffering for it, yeah? so sometimes you just leave the word dukkha as untranslated. Now, so this word also, asawa also, something like that, it's it hard to translate into English. Yeah? So even sometimes there are translators also leave the word as just asawa. Leave the word as asawas. Now, what are these asawas? Now, these asawas, they are, they are in a way tainted or slight corruption of our minds and, and they can follow us, whatever that we do, if we are not able to see them clearly. Of course, on the unwholesome side, you can, you, if on the unwholesome side, they are like defilements. But this asawa, it can be connected with the wholesome side. I repeat again. This asawa can be connected with the wholesome side also. That means uh, the things that you are doing wholesome, your dana, when you are taking, taking your precepts, or even at your meditation, this asawa can follow you along too without you able to see it, yeah, unless your mind is sharp enough. Yeah, yeah. So it can follow us from unwholesome deeds and wholesome deeds. Uh, it can follow us and make it a bit more scary a little bit. Even in the Noble Eightfold Path that you are practicing, uh, there's also, if you're practicing it, without able to see it more deeper, then there are also asawas follow along with this noble eightfold path, which is actually, is not the words that I've said, you know, this is, this is the words of what the Buddha said. Now, if you are, yeah, uh, middle length discourse, so uh, number 14, uh, I think, or, or, or I, I, maybe I forgot about which number, but it's, it's talking about 40 things. <laughs> something about something to do with 40. The title something to do with 40. Yeah? May not mean Majima number 40, I forgot. But it's something to do with 40 things. Yeah? Within that 40 things, the Buddha mentioned it. Buddha divided the noble eightfold path into two parts. One part of the noble eightfold path that connected with asawas, connected with these taints. And noble eightfold path is supra mundane. That means it's free from these things, these asavas. And it's maybe interesting for us to look into it. But if you just read like that, you can have a lot of problem what the Buddha is talking about. But here for today's talk, I'm going to show you to you how we can able to recognize them. How we can recognize them. And the moment you can recognize them, how we can able to abandon them, at least as much as you can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's good that the, uh, we, 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 pay, we, we pay attention to see it a bit more deeper, especially all these asavas. Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, this, this noble eightfold path, uh, it can be corrupted, tainted by these asavas also. Yeah. And noble eightfold path without all this tainted is supra mundane. These two things. Uh, not only that, these asawas and these taints, these mental taints, they can go all the way up, all the way up. Just it is mentioned in the Abhidhamma yeah, that these asawas can go all the way up one consciousness before you attain enlightenment. That means the next consciousness is the path consciousness. 
or whichever level of enlightenment that you're going to go, then this asava will follow you, you right just before that consciousness. Yeah. So, so, uh, so all the way, yeah, that, that, that all the way, you know, uh, one consciousness before that. So the higher that you go, the higher of enlightenment that you go, the less asavas is going to hold on to you. Yeah? So this is the meaning that it is going to connect to us even with the wholesome teach in our meditation is even right next to default, right next to enlightenment. This is how deep it can go. Yeah? What what more than we are talking about just MCO or lockdown and so on. You know? So this thing is something that for us to look into it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are the asavas? What are the types of asavas that we can look into it? Now, what are the types of asavas? Yeah. There, are, there are four types of asavas. Yeah. There are four, four types of, of asavas. There are four types of these mental taints. Yeah. Now, the first mental taint is called the taints of sensual desire. The taints of sensual desire. Uh, number two. Number two is desire for existence. The Pali word is bhava, B H A V A. Uh, sensual desires, the first one. The second one is desire for existence. Now, the third one. Uh, the third one is ignorance. Ignorance of avijja, yeah? ignorance. Yeah? And the fourth one, and the fourth one is mentioned in the Abhidhamma, but not in the Sutta. The, first, the Sutta is mentioned only these three, the first three. The fourth one is wrong views. Yeah? The fourth one is wrong views. In a way, uh, um, so in the Abhidhamma, there are four categories. In the Suttas, you got three. But anyway, wrong views and this um, this uh, avijja, they are in a way connected, huh? in a way connected. Uh, so anyway, so what does it mean here? Uh, so now, now you know that it's four, then how does it relate to our life? How does it go undercurrent? Uh, how does it go deep? Uh, uh, how does it go very deep into our life and how does it react uh, um, everybody my streaming right now uh, is quite slow right now like I notice it uh, just give me a few minutes uh, while I reset my phone for a while I off and on the phone for a while then sometimes the speed gets better Are we on again? Everybody can hear me? All right, good. Okay. Well, I, uh, I can't do anything about the internet. Huh? <laughs> if it's going to slow, it's going to be slow. If it's going to be fast, it will be fast. Huh? You just have to endure it. Huh? Anyway, I was saying that, well, we have these four types of uh, asavas and how, how these four asavas, huh? whether whether you are in MCO or whether you are not in MCO, whether you are locked down or not, whether you are this life or next life, whether you whichever race, these are your normal. These are your norms. That is so difficult for us to see that it 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 goes as I would as I use the word. They are the undercurrents. They are like the they are like the uh, things that you cannot see, like the sewage, you know, underneath where you, when you walk all the it, it flows underneath your legs so you don't see it, all of them so this is actually what is happening in our lives these are what we call the norms <laughs> so the new normal here the, the the external physical normal they will change they will change but no matter how you change uh, this asava will pull you 
It's just like they are the puppet master. They are the puppet master and they, every string they're going to pull you in however that you're going to be, whichever situation that you're going to be or whichever lives that you're going to be, they're going to hold you without you even realizing it. Let, let us see how does this asawa that is connected in our life. Let, let us give you a few examples here. Now, even like, for example, to say uh, you are in the lockdown right now. You are in the uh, MCO right now. You are the CMCO right now. You know? Then you go out, let's say, to a restaurant and you sit there alone, let's say. And you are separated from people. You follow the SOP. Well and good. No, no problem. Yeah? Good. But once the food comes in, uh, you look at the food. Wow. Good. Uh. You still eat. Although externally, uh, you are away from people. But the central desire just follow you while you are eating. Because you still enjoy that particular food. That is what I mean here. Uh, the central desire, it follows us when we are even doing, even we are externally new normal, but internally, internally, we are still do the same thing, the same habit, the same desire, the same central desire that arises. Uh, so that, that one is easy for us to know because that one is being mentioned again and again. But what is more difficult to, for us to know is that um, take a bit more difficult ones like when you're doing dana, uh, when you're doing offering dana, you are doing uh, giving, you are doing service, you are offering your 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 offering your uh, what do you call that? Uh, you're, you're offering your service, you're giving your energy, you're giving your time to cer certain certain um, charity or certain society or certain this one, huh? whichever it is. Huh? As I said, even that wholesomeness huh, that you are doing, this asawas will just go underline and goes together with you. Yeah? It goes together with you. And these asawas are not necessary. It will bring you to, to woeful states. You know? It can even with that, bring you all the way to highest heaven also. <laughs> this asawa, although it's a kind of a defilement, but it does not mean that all the time it's going to bring you into hell, into woeful states and so all that. No. You see, for example, when you're giving, people when they're giving, offering and giving and so on, when they give, when they offer something and, and then they say offering, to the monks or to, to people or you give food and so on. Then with the back of the mind, uh, some of them, they like some name there, you know, There's some name, some fame a little bit. You know? uh, then it's become tainted a little bit. Uh, that, one, that one we can see. Uh? But then sometimes uh, for us, uh, we offer something. Then after that, we say, ah, uh, Hopefully, uh, in next life, uh, we can reborn in the better planes of existence. We can reborn in a happier planes of existence. We don't have to come back and go through all this uh, human world and we have to have sickness and we have this and we have that suffering. You know, when we go up higher planes, then we can have more good time. Now you see what, it, what I mean here. Here, it means that you, although you're offering here, when you're doing offering here, but your undercurrent here is that you desire for existence. You desire for existence, that is to say, uh, you, you still want to exist. You still want to be. You still, the power is still there. Uh, you still want to exist in the sense that you want to reborn in the in a higher planes of existence. And then, that because of that wholesomeness you have done, and so many wholesomeness that you have done, wholesome action that you have done, then after you die, you reborn there. Not to say that you will not reborn there, but you reborn there. Uh, but then I'll see you want to get out of samsara or not? What for? So happy here. 
Yeah, life is good. Uh. What for are you going out here and going there? What, what's the point, isn't it? Uh, this is exactly what it means by asama. It follows you. It follows you because although you give, but there is a, a desire for existence. And it follows the higher planes of existence. Now here, even the Buddha also taught that, that when you offer something that is good merits, this good merits, it will bring you to this one also. The Buddha knows it you know, because he knows that this is what a lot of people will do. And if you talk about Nibbana here, getting out of samsara, they can't buy it. They can't swallow it. They want, they want to have happiness. They want to have joy in this very life or in the future lives to come. So they do a lot of good deeds. But if you ask them to get out of samsara, uh, no, no. Maybe samsara can wait. Let's enjoy first. Uh, so this is what it means here. The asamas that connected to all the existence. Huh? Yeah. Even sometimes these asavas are like it comes into like um, meditation also. Yeah. It comes into this meditation that even if you want to cultivate that good goodness, uh, you just want to escape from it also, escape from some unpleasantness. Uh, say for example, if you are in meditation and you're sitting there, <clears throat> especially doing, um, Maybe you can do samatha or vipassana, but this time let's talk about vipassana here. Now, vipassana here, you are taught to observe the feelings, or notice the feelings, the pain that coming up. Now, a lot of people, a lot of yogis, a lot of meditators, when they observe the pain, after a while, uh, the mind doesn't want to watch the pain anymore because you cannot take it anymore. You beta hand already, you know. You want to the mind want to escape. The mind wants to escape because at that moment of time, the mind feels that the, the, the aversion has a, re a reason. The aversion a reason, the difficulty has a reason. So you want to shift the mind away. Shift the mind away for something more pleasant. Uh, something more pleasant. It wants to shift away to something more pleasant. Then it doesn't want to watch the pain anymore. So this is exactly the asawas, even in the midst of your meditation, the asawas has come in, the desire of something which is pleasant has come in without even the yogis realizing it. Without the yogis even realizing it. So it's how deep, even in a state of meditation, it can actually go. And in so many ways also, sometimes it comes with ulterior motives. Sometimes it comes with ulterior motives like, for example, you know, um, should I um, walking, maybe after walking, maybe I should go and have a drink, you know. While walking, you already start thinking or start planning what you want to do afterwards already to a little bit of enjoyment. That is where the asavas come in. Yeah? Uh, this is how, how fine that asawa is. Uh, uh, how fine that it, 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 it is. Uh, and in a sense of like asawa's connected with uh, uh, ignorance. Uh, connected with ignorance is something like what is really not there, you believe it to be there. Uh, what is really there, you believe it to be not there. <laughs> Huh? There's two opposite things, you know. For example, uh, ignorance here means that uh, uh, you say that there is such a thing as this noble eightfold path. Huh? Then there are people who totally have no idea of mental development, noble eightfold path, and so on. So they are completely ignorant about it. Huh? Just like, for example, that nibbana is there. Not to say there, but Nibbana can be realized. Just that you have not seen it yet. Or you don't intend to see it also. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe you don't intend to see it, but for some people, it's not there yet. Maybe about to come yeah, for you to realize it. Yeah. Now, the thing is that right now, if you have not seen it, that means you're still ignorant. Because it's there, you have not seen it yet. It is there, 
it is not seen yet. So in a way, it is ignorance. Yeah. Or sometimes we look at um, like anatta. No. Anatta is a bit more, dif sometimes it's difficult for us to understand. For example, like there, there is, is non-self. It's only the process of mind and body that is experiencing well at every moment of what we are going through. But we see, because our mind cannot penetrate so deep, uh, we will look at all in the front, in the facade. Uh, mind and body are uh, coming and going. Uh, how could that be? After all, uh, this mind and body, there must be a somebody control. There must be a self-control, a soul control. There must be an almighty uh, control our lives. They cannot be just this mind and body alone. It's, uh, uh, because of that, what is not that? They believe that it is there. Because all this self and soul, if you go into a deeper aspect of the development of the mind, even your mind is so deep, so powerful, so clear, you don't see all this creator, almighty God, or, or uh, a self or a soul that is, exists forever. The mind do not see all those things. But when we do not meditate, we think that they are there. We believe that they are there. What is not there, we believe it to be there. We believe it to be there. That is where the ignorance is what we, what is what we mean by ignorance. What is not there, you, you, you believe that it's there. What is there, you believe that it's not there. So many ways that this ignorance will come in. And also the wrong views. The wrong view here is, means that you attach to all kinds of view. For example, you attach to like a certain view like what karma? What is the problem? Yes, there's no such thing as cause and effect. Die, die already. What is that to reborn and what is that to go? No, I don't believe all those things. Uh, then he says, don't believe all these things. That means here, it means the mind is... Can't see. He believes in their free thinker. Free thinker also, they attach to all their beliefs also. Uh, not that they, they don't believe anything. Uh, so here, when you attach to a certain view, which is, does not parallel with the reality, then all these are wrong views. Yeah? All these are wrong view. Yeah? So wrong view here, there are so many things. Huh? If you want to know what is wrong view, then it's also good that if you go to uh, Majima Nikaya, oh, no, sorry, Dika Nikaya. Majima Nikaya also, yes. Uh, Dika Nikaya, you go into the long discourses, chapter number one, very easy to remember. Even the middle length discourses, you go to chapter number one, is also very easy to remember. Huh? So, these two, they tell you various kinds of all these wrong beliefs and wrong understandings, you know, whether you can able to understand what is this going on or not. Huh? Because we will just never know. Some of us may just believe it, you know. But whether your belief and what the Buddha mentioned, uh, whether they can tell you or not, uh, that's just another thing. Sometimes, sometimes you need some people to help you, to show it to you that, that uh, all these wrong views and what the Buddha mentioned is, is meant, how they all are uh, connected together. Yeah? Yeah. So these four wrong views, uh, it, will, it will hold you and to do whatever wholesome or unwholesome. Uh, so even as for example, you, you may have some wrong view. You believe that there must be a, a, a almighty, there must be a self, this, this universal permanent consciousness. You know, this consciousness or this voice, it, it propels me to do something good for the world. It, it asks me to, it, it says into my mind, it says into my heart that I should, I should, uh, I should help these people. I should help these beings. You believe in something un unwholesome, but in the front is doing something wholesome. 
So the front here is you are doing a lot of these wholesome deeds. Uh, but behind that, it holds on to a certain belief that you can do a lot of wholesome deeds. And yet, the person can end up in the, uh, in the heavens and so on, you know, not necessarily in hell all the time. Uh, so this is what it means here. The, the front there, the, whatever that in front there you can do, but behind it is this asavas that is pulling you, pulling you to do wholesome deeds, unwholesome deeds. And then it makes you stay in the cycle of birth and rebirth. Uh, it won't let you out from it. <clears throat> uh, so this is this is what it means huh? uh, the asavas here now then the next thing uh, the next thing is this how can we reduce these asavas or how can we altogether eradicate these asavas the, the Buddha also mentioned it also is whether that we can understand it or not huh? hold on huh? So the Buddha mentioned about how to reduce these asavas and how for us to actually to um, actually to help us in our everyday life into reducing these asavas and finally the Buddha also mentioned how we're going to eradicate these asavas also. Yeah? Now this 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 topic that I talk about, you know. And this whole thing that I'm talking about, this is mentioned in the Majjhima Nikaya chapter number two. Easy. Just now I thought about number one, that is all about that wrong view and all that. Then the first one, uh, chapter number two, Sutta number two is all about these asavas. Uh, all about these asavas. He called the Sapasava Sutta. So this inside there, the Buddha tells you what are the asavas, what are the mental taints, and how you can able to overcome them. And a lot of number of things, uh, Buddhists actually have done it. You know? And we're going to see it more in perspective, more clearer, why did the Buddha mention, and, and those things that you have done, where is it derived from? Huh? <clears throat> now here, here there are, seven things, seven things that the Buddha mentioned. Uh, the Buddha mentioned seven things, how we can abandon these mental taints or how we can man, we, we can able to reduce these asavas. Uh, the first one, we go through the first to seven first, then after that, we can explain a little bit more. Uh, the first one is by seeing. Seeing here is not by just your eyes, you know, this is mental seeing, you know. Uh, the Pali word is dasana. Hmm. Uh, the second one is uh, the second one here is restraining by holding back, restraining. Huh? Uh, the third one is by using proper usage. Uh, the fourth one is by enduring or by patience. Huh? Uh, the fifth one is by avoiding. Uh, you avoid something or some people. The next one, the sixth one is by removing. Removing. And the seventh one is by developing. Uh, by development. Uh, all right. So we're going to go through these things. Uh, uh, here, in these seven things, is also divided into two categories. Uh, the first category here is the the let, let's put it the first category here it's the you can only suppress it you can only suppress the things you can only abandon them temporarily but you cannot eradicate them yeah. so the first one is you can abandon them temporarily but you cannot eradicate them now the second group is you completely eradicate them you completely eradicate them yeah. so the first one, by seeing and by development, the first and the seventh belongs to eradication type. It belongs to the eradication. Yeah. 
Where else? The second, third, fourth, fifth, two, three, four, five, six. After this, we are expand again. Two, three, four, five, six. That one, it's by you're suppressing your name. Yeah. Um, before that, now, Alex, perhaps you need to allow me allow people to screen share. If you can able to allow the screen share, then perhaps I can put my some slides up. Now it still cannot. Yeah. Hold on there. Yeah. Never mind. If cannot, never mind. I'll just talk it through. <laughs> Um, uh, here so the first one until the seventh one yeah? now the first one by seeing what does Buddha explain by seeing by dasana here by seeing here means that uh, the part seeing here means it eradicates certain mental things but not all yet uh, certain mental and this by seeing uh, the buddha specifically uh, pointed to sotapanna uh, pointed to the first stage of enlightenment and what are the first what are the first stage of enlightenment what are the first stage of enlightenment uh, that we can able to eradicate what are the things that we can eradicate? Now, most of us know that the, the first eradication of the defilements uh, is the skeptical doubt. You completely eradicate the skeptical doubt. Yeah? And the Sotapanna also it eradicates the wrong view. Yeah? These two things, skeptical doubt and wrong view. But the wrong view here is divided again into two parts. Uh, as we know as fetters, you know. Here, the first one is eradication of the wrong view of a self or a soul. Hmm? A self or a soul here. Very much, very internal. You know? And then the second part of the wrong view that is eradicated is eradicating the wrong view about the rites and rituals that is going to bring you towards enlightenment. Two types of wrong view, but they all falls under wrong view. Uh, so, wrong view and skeptical doubt has to be removed in order for you to enter into the noble path. Without removing these two, it's impossible. Uh, they are they are very they are very strong um, defilements, but not the desire yet, no? not the sensual desire yet, not the craving for desire for existence also, not yet. No? You're only removing the wrong view first and skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt also, in a certain sense, they fall under ignorance, no? falls under ignorance. So in the sense that the ignorance also are shaken right now, but the ignorance are not completely eradicated yet. No? So, here, the first one, the, the wrong view here, we're going to re, when a person develops, especially the satipatthana, uh, develop the satipatthana to the full extent of it. I wouldn't say full. Uh, if, it's, if it's full, uh, then you'll be arahant already. <laughs> At least you'll develop to a very wonderful development that you can able to pass through. As, as a worldling and you pass in, it goes into the, the noble ones. So when you pass through that, uh, here is where they, at the path consciousness, at the path consciousness, it eradicates that defilements. So it, when it eradicates those defilements, it also eradicates, of course, the taints also, the taints of ignorance, especially, sorry, the taints of wrong view, especially. Uh, it, completely eradicate them. That means uh, when this wrong view is gone, all the underlying, the, the string uh, that holds you is being cut off. And the holds you. So you got three more strings to for you to pull you. So four strings, 
now only three strings only. Uh, one string, the ignorant string, also a bit more shaky already right now. But the other two strings are still strong. Uh, so it, it means in this way. Uh, so here it means that uh, once it's eradicated, it won't come back again. In this cycle of birth and rebirth, in the future lives, it is no more there. Uh, that means there, there, there will be a time that you're going to in future, they will be getting out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. And the Buddha said that within seven lives, uh, within seven lives, the Sotapanna can get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. Uh, but the thing is that, uh, how are we going to see this Asavas then? How are we going to penetrate these Asavas? This Asavas is so difficult uh, to penetrate to, for us to be able to see it in our everyday life. Unless you mix with the right people, you mix with the right people, with people with Dhamma, and they can able to point it out to you. Or you can develop the mind, further develop the mind, especially into the Satipatthana. When the mind develops, it develops the faculty of wisdom, the faculty of penetration of the mind into the deeper aspect of the true nature of this mind and body process. And then that time, you can able to differentiate the asawas. Uh, you can able to see the asawas here, whether the asawas are there or the asawas are not there. The taints are there or the taints are not there. They can able to see more deeper. The Buddha used the word here, yoniso manasikara. Wise attention. And this is not a reflection right now. This is exactly that the mind penetrates into it, sees it into it, that it can able to see this is wholesome. This is tainted with asavas, that the mind can differentiate these two. And it's good that for us to develop this part, this wise attention again and again until the mind gets develop it well enough that we can get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. If not, it will just keep holding you without we realizing it. It will be your normal. It will be your normal. Huh? Uh, until we eradicate it, then, uh, then it's not the, the, not the normal anymore. Uh, because the normal is being shaken already. Uh, the internal normal. Uh, so that one... We, ha we, have to, we have to develop it. Huh? So, so when, when a person sees, when the, you abandon by seeing, that means you, you abandon by seeing the true nature of this wrong view and right view also. That is to say, uh, all the wrong views that you uh, used to attach to about there's a self or a soul, there's a God and all that thing, you cannot attach to them anymore because the wrong view is all shaken up. There's no, there's no claw for it to hold on to this type of wrong view. You see the truth. You see the, the, the Nibbana itself. Then you cannot go and cling on to all this type of wrong views anymore. So you're free from it, which is very good. Yeah? Uh, so here the Buddha talked about and different types of wrong view, uh, speculative view. And then if you read about it now, you're going to have a hard time what the Buddha is talking about. So I'm just summarizing here to, to show you that the wrong view, the various types of wrong views uh, uh, is being eradicated. Uh, the wrong view about self, a wrong view about soul, all is being eradicated. Uh, uh, what's next? Now the next one, now the next one the Buddha mentioned about this asamas to be abandoned by restraining. Uh, by restraining. This one by restraining here, we are going into just a temporary abandonment. Whereas the first one is permanently abandonment. That means you could completely eradicate all its root. Whereas here, cool it down so that uh, the asamas does not affect in our life so much. So that our mind doesn't, although we say don't, but once in a while it will comes up. But we make it less, less and less. It will not be totally eradicate but make it less. Yeah? Uh, so what, what do you mean by restraint here? 
Restraint here means that all our six senses, our six senses begin with the eye. Uh, begin with the eye, nose, seeing, hearing, smelling, uh, tasting, touching, and thoughts, thinking. One, two, three, four, five, touch. Uh, that's the sixth one, thinking, yes. Uh, so all these things is to be restrained, is to be hold back. Yeah. Now the principle of this restrainer, the principle that the, to hold back, you need one major quality of the mind. That one major quality is mindfulness. If you don't have that mindfulness, you weren't able to restrain. Because when the mindfulness becomes strong and clear, it is exactly, it will do the restrainment for, for, for you. Yeah? Automatically, you don't have to make an effort for, even for you to do it. Yeah? This is especially when we see in the, uh, especially in the Satipatthana yogis, uh, when, they, when you, you've been in a retreat for some time, Day in, day out, day in, day out, you meditate and so on. You see, when there's a continuity of that mindfulness, that clarity of that mindfulness, the depthness of the depth of that mindfulness is there. When something, a sound, or uh, something were to pass through, a squirrel were to pass through, your eyes don't even want to go and look at it. Also, you know, you know that sound is there, or you know that the squirrel is there, but you don't even want to lift up your eyes to see it. Doesn't mean that you don't know, you know. The desire for the seeing also is not even there. To see what is going on, to hear what is going on also is not even there. Or, or sometimes there's people talking a little bit further away. You're not so busy body to go and slowly go and listen to what their conversation is. Because it holds back by that mindfulness. Uh, it holds back by the mindfulness. Uh, so the mindfulness, the quality of the mindfulness here, in the quality of restraining they are synonymous with each other. Yeah. It's just uh, whether we can see it or not. No? But most of the time, while we are in a way training and we try to have casually everyday life, huh, we make an effort. We make an effort to pull back. You know? If there is uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, dancing and singing and so on, uh, then the restraint is that you know what is going on, but it's not necessary for me to go there. If your desire is strong, then of course it's going to go there. Now, if your desire is weak, then you know you know that yeah, some people are singing there. They're not necessary, just walk past. Just walk through. Yeah? Uh, sometimes even with this side of restraining of our senses and so on, uh, then you'll find that over time that even like the movies. I'm not so interested. Woman, ula, boom, doesn't matter, la, you know. If, if it's there, it's there. It doesn't, if done, it doesn't matter. We're not so obsessive about it, you know. Uh, so, so too, like certain food, you know, people are so obsessive about certain food. Because during this lockdown and all that, you cannot get your best food, you know. You'll be start thinking of it so much. Uh. This is your obsession, you know. That obsession uh, is very strong. Craving is very strong. So, Restrainment here is that when the mindfulness is there, the quality of mindfulness is there, you say that, oh, that food, uh, well, if you have, have, you don't have, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That means that your mind is already pulled away from that, from that desire. Yeah? It pulls away from that desire, yeah? which is good, which is wonderful. It makes the mind so much more calm, so much more peaceful. So too many things uh, we have to restrain ourselves. Yeah. But it's not easy, you know. It's not easy for lay people because there's so many wonderful things around you. Your house is beautiful, the TV is very big, the bed also is very big, soft and nice, air con, you 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 can go any as you like, maybe not now, <laughs> later on. You you can go, you know. Just want to fill up the senses on you. Yeah. Come, come to retreat. Uh, maybe, maybe a few more years. Uh, maybe I'm settled down a bit more. Uh, then I'll come for a retreat. Uh. <laughs> yeah. All right, the next one. 
The next one is, the, again, this is temporary abandonment. And this one is, the next one is the third one is using. This is what we, we say that you reflecting wisely on the four requisites. Yeah. Uh, here the Buddha is talking to the monks. Uh, in this sutta, the Buddha is talking to the monks. The four requisites here means your shelter, one, your clothings, another one, food and medicine. Uh, these are the four basic needs for the monks. Yeah? Four basic needs for the monks. But for of course, for, for you all, your basic needs are a little bit more than monks, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more than, than monks. So, so too, even whether that, that basic needs uh, are, uh, uh, the basic needs, are whether it's layperson or whether it's for monks, uh, those things, you have to reflect on them wisely. Now, even this BGF, you also did a lot of this reflection before meal, you know, even in your puja book also, you all have those things, you know. Uh, you see, we take this food not for pleasure or for intoxicant, uh, nor for the sake of physical beauty of attractiveness, but for the endurance and continuance of this body, for the ending of discomfort, for assisting the holy life, considering Thus, I shall terminate the old feelings of hunger without arousing the new feelings of desire. And I shall be healthy and blameless and I shall live in comfort. So that means uh, before you eat, a lot of times I see before they eat, they put their palms together then they reflect on the food in front of them. You know, Sometimes I see devotees, I do not know what, I do not know what is going on with the, inside the mind. You know? They reflect that and they reflect to them. Which is good. Not to say it's bad. Huh? Huh. It's wonderful. That way, that way you reflect on about it. So it reduces that desire for food. But I have also seen, huh? I have also seen that in the beginning they reflect, huh? whatever they reflect, I do not know. But after three minutes later, four minutes later, huh? ah, wow, the food is so good right now. How do you make it? Huh? How much did you put? How do you cook it? What, what ingredient do you put? You see, it makes so, so soft, so nice. You taste it, mm, your, all your reflection just now, three minutes or five minutes ago, completely forgotten. <laughs> completely forgotten. Yeah. Uh, so we reflect in the beginning, but there's no follow-up through. Uh, now, in the, in the meditation center, yes, we follow, we follow up. Even the beginning of the eating, until the end of the eating that you have to be mindful of your taste, of your touch, of your eating, and so on. You've got to be mindful all the way through as best as you can. Huh? But in the lay life, sometimes, no. Sometimes here, here we reflect, but after that, huh, it's a different story already. Huh? So this is what is happening. Huh? Huh? So reflecting upon this, like... Uh, your food, your clothing. That clothing means that you take these clothing. It's just for covering for this body. For example, we take this rope is to cover this body um, um, to prevent or from from heat and cold to to avoid the mosquitoes or glad flies or bees or stings. Things like this, huh? we use this and we reflect it wisely, not for not to get attracted by it, uh, not to get attracted by it, thinking that this is beautiful and so on. Uh, but on the lay lay people side, it's different. You, know? you take this, you you wear is to sometimes is to show off. The wear is to 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 show off a little bit to people. Uh, that then the taints are all there. Uh, so if you reflect wisely, then we remove the taints. We reduce the taints. Uh, once in a while, it comes up. Then if we are careful enough, we are clear enough, we are watchful of them. Uh, uh, so the shelter also the same thing. The medicine also the same thing. Uh, nowadays, people take medicine here, including supplements and all that. They are not just for their health needs, but it's also for beauty also. I see uh, they they. They want to make themselves beautiful and so on. They take certain type of medicine, including those Botox and whatever, what not, you know? Not just eating only, but injection and so on. Yeah? So, if you reflect wisely, 
if you reflect wisely, if you reflect in the right manner, then the desire, the taints become lessened. Right? It becomes lessened. It helps to lessen. If you do it a long period of time, uh, then that desire becomes very minimal. Uh, but it's not totally eradicated yet. Very minimal. So when it's minimal, that means there's more peace inside the mind, and which is going to be very helpful, especially for the development of the mind. Yeah? <clears throat> and then the next things, the next one, the fourth one, I think. One, two, four. Okay. The fourth one tends to be abandoned by patience or enduring. Here means endure means that you have to go through some degree. Sometimes you go through some degree of hardship. For example, that like you go through degree of you have to stay at home. Difficult for some people because cannot go out, cannot go to work. Every day is inside a home. Mentally very find it very uh difficult to go through. When the mind is not trained, when the mind is not trained, that hardship, that difficulty of the mind, they sometimes they express it out in violence and in they hurt their own family members, violence to their own children or to their own spouse. You know? uh, and because they do not know how to control that type of, of uh, mental uh, difficulty. So they get angry, they get aversion, they get hatred arises. Yeah. So, so here tends to be abandoned by this one is that you must have a lot of patience. Difficulty, yes. And sometimes, for example, like uh, hunger and thirst or sometimes like cold or heat. When we bear up with, with these things, especially when you come to like meditation retreat, things are not so fine like your home. Things are a bit bare minimum just for you to survive, to meditate. And then sometimes you may face with mosquitoes, face with, with uh, the wind is strong, cold and so on. Then at time you got to really bear with it. If you don't bear up with it, uh, your mind gets very unsettled, angry, very feel very terrible. All you did, all you want is to get out of this meditation, only, uh, to get out, to get away from this meditation. Uh, uh, so by enduring. So a lot of times our life, uh, we go through pains and go through sickness and so on. Uh, that time we have to go through. We have to be patient with it. Be patient with all these pains and all this suffering state of mind. Uh, uh, when you have this patience then the anger does not arise. This is especially true when we are meditating. Uh, when we are meditating, when we are meditating, especially with all the pain that arises, uh, we have to be very patient. If not, if we are not patient, the anger all arises. Uh, uh. Avoidance. Things to be abandoned by avoiding. What do you mean by avoiding? What does it avoid? Here, the Buddha specifically says that the external things that you need to avoid. Here, because sometimes bhikkhus uh, or monks, they go into a forest and so on. They meet with wild elephants, leopards or tigers or lions. And during the Buddha's time, and they have lions, leopards, wild elephants if they go into the forest. You know? So he says that you have to avoid these type of places. If you don't avoid these type of places, your fear, your fear arises. Your fear arises and then it makes your mind even difficult to meditate. Yeah? So he says that you must avoid going into, wandering into unsuitable resort. Yeah? Unsuitable resort, this is one thing. Avoiding, the next one is uh, papamita, uh, evil friends, evil people. Yeah. You have to avoid these evil people because if you don't avoid the evil people, then they're going to influence you to do a lot of bad deeds. All your wholesomeness and all your unwholesomeness uh, is because of whether you mix with the right people or the wrong people. If you mix with the wrong people, all your taints, uh, all your deformance is going to be so much more. Uh, uh, so, so here, see here is about avoiding. Uh, 
You know, sometimes uh, there are monks uh, which I've known of, uh, if I read also. They purposely want to go into the place uh, where there is leopards are there, <laughs> where there are wild elephants are there. Oh, go there. I must overcome my fear. Overcome my fear. It's not that is not the way. Uh, I, I don't think that is the way. Uh. Because like in, in, in Sri Lanka, once in a while you hear uh, that monks is trampled to death by the wild elephants in the forest. <laughs> not to say it often, uh, once in a while you hear that. Uh. So it is not, not it is not it's a safe place. Uh, uh, so when you have these wild animals running about, uh, they, they see you as a, a threat, you know, you are coming into their area, they see you as a threat. So this one is by removing, by, by, I'm oh, sorry, by avoiding. Yeah? You're avoiding the bad people also. Yeah? Yeah. Now, what is the next thing? Things to be abandoned by removing. Abandoned by removing here means to re remove your greed, hatred, and delusion when they arises in the mind. That is to say, when the mind is filled with greed, uh, then we could look at it as something like things are changing, things are impermanent. Then it overcomes the greed. If the anger arises, we develop that metta to overcome the anger, overcome the hatred. The, uh, 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 the ignorance arises, we use the wisdom to overcome it. Uh, so you, we overcome it in many ways. Yeah. So of all of this greed, hatred, and delusion. And we can talk about this a lot. Yeah. The next one. Tends to be abandoned by developing. Uh, this, this one tends to be abandoned by development. Uh. This is again by total eradication. This is not just temporary eradication. Total eradication. Here it means develop cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment. Yeah. The seven factors of enlightenment begin with mindfulness. Then you have a, a investigation of Dhamma, yeah. Dhamma Vichaya. Then we have uh, effort, we have joy, then we have tranquility, we have uh, concentration, then you have uh, Upeka. Yeah. You have Upeka. These seven factors of enlightenment. You cultivate them. These seven factors of enlightenment, uh, of course, here we cannot go through all of them. But it is in the, especially in the Satipatthana, you develop Satipatthana, you develop the four foundation of mindfulness, you will fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment. Yeah? Uh, so th that's what the Buddha says in Anapanasati Sutta. Uh, so these seven factors of enlightenment, they are none other than the mind that you pay attention, the noting mind, the mind that notes. And when it notes it, it notes it in a very balanced manner, very clear manner. All these, all these enlightenment factors are, are doing their own function. Now, I talk about these seven factors of enlightenment for many retreats, eh, in fact. Now, now each re sometimes per retreat, I just talk about seven factors of enlightenment. It takes about two or three weeks, two, two weeks plus sometimes just to finish on that particular topic, all the seven. So if you're interested to know about these seven factors of enlightenment, you have to, well, go to my blog and then you can dig it out uh, from there. But basically here, the seven factors of enlightenment. That means you cultivate them to the full extent until arahanship is attained. Until the arahanship is attained, then that means uh, all forms of fetters and all forms of taints are totally eradicated. That means the taints of ignorance, the taints of removing, uh, sorry, the desire for existence are totally eradicated. Even one per even that, that, that desire for existence comes with a jhana also. Then you, you go into the jhana if your mind is not eradicated yet. Uh, the underlying desire for existence, because the desire for existence from the Brahma world and the higher worlds are, are still there. So until one eradicates completely at the, at the Arahan level, then these taints are completely out, are completely cut off. 
So that's how deep this asava can go. But it's but until here, yeah, until here, this this seven things, uh, beginning from the uh, seeing, uh, beginning from seeing, and then you restrain by using, by enduring, by avoiding, by removing, and finally by a development or cultivation of the seven factors of enlightenment. Then the Buddha shows every part how we can able to eradicate this asavas. Yeah? All right. Wow, it's already 11 o'clock. Okay, so we stop here. Huh? We stop here. And you have a Q and A. Huh? Let's see. I got some. I got some more time. Don't worry. Hungry, but still got time. Don't worry. <laughs> Where's the question? Oh. <clears throat> okay. All right, hold on, everybody. I would like to ask the question about jealousy. It seems it is everywhere. How to overcome this human weakness? Huh? Um, th this one, this this topic about jealousy right now. That I was I was talking about it on Thursday, and I'm going to talk about it in the coming Tuesday also, because the overcoming of jealousy here is the development of mudita. Mudita here means altruistic joy. Altruistic joy means that you see other people, you can see other people's success without that envy. You can be happy, truly be happy for the other person. Truly happy for the other person, that means uh, you, you see people overcome or you see people gain some material gains or, or some spiritual gains. Uh, then when you look at them, your, your mind doesn't feel you are inadequate that they should not have gained so much. Uh, how come they gain so much? I don't get it. No, With that, that is envy, the state of envy, state of jealousy arises. But instead of that, you see them with, you're happy for them. You're happy for their gains. You're happy for their, for their whatever development, whatever material gains that arises. So when you are happy for them in that way, that is what we call mudita. And the mudita and jealousy, they are complete opposite of each other. They are complete opposite. Just like metta, they are completely opposite of, of uh, anger. Whereas mudita is the complete opposite of jealousy. Okay? So it's good for you to develop jealousy. Yes, in the world, there's a lot of people with with our love, this jealousy, because it cannot be happy for others. There's always that holding back and you feel that you're inadequate. You feel that you are, you are not the same level. I want to be the same level. You're getting too much and so on. And then jealousy arises. Okay? Any more question? Do the devas have sickness? Do devas have sickness? Uh, this question, I got to wait. I got to ask the devas first. I got to go and consult the devas before I, uh, I uh, come back to answer your question. <laughs> How do I know? I'm not there yet. Even we were there, we forgot already. Yeah. We for forget already. But it seems that like it's mentioned in the books they don't have sickness. Uh. Yeah. It seems that like it's mentioned in the books. Uh. But... That's all in the books, that's what, what is mentioned in the books. But actually, do you see them? Do you talk to them? Did you been in the in the uh, realm? Beats me, you know. I forgot about all those things. All right. So next question. <clears throat> Oh, asama is the state of mind from life to life. Simply put, the usual norms in this lifetime would normally appear in the next life. In a way, yes. Uh, your habits. Your habits will pull you from one lifetime after another lifetime. Take, for example, like Venerable Sariputta. He was reborn as a, he was reborn as a monkey for 500 lifetimes. Uh. 
even if it becomes an arahant, it becomes an arahant already at the last life. Huh? When you see a puddle of water, he has to jump over. <laughs> that, that tendency just to jump over. You know? So you see, even an arahant also, the tendency to, to do certain things because of our past development and our past cultivation and our past uh, unwholesome habits and taints and so on, uh, it kind of etched into our mind. It etch into our mind, and then even when we become arahants, you know, we don't have the taints anymore, and yet certain personality is still there. But it's not a default personality. It's just, it's just like you bake the cake, uh, come out that way already. Is that way already? You cannot like I'm going to adjust it in another way, because it's baked already in that way. Yeah? So, so even that also, uh, this asava, although the deformments are totally eradicated, but even right until to the last life as an arahant also, yes, it still follows in a certain sense. So, but for arahants, they are without the taints, but for us, we still have the taints, so it will follow, follow us. If you believe in wrong views, uh, the next life, the wrong view will follow you. If your craving is so strong, it's so obsessive, the next life, it will follow you. Yeah, it will follow you because these are part of the norms. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's the next question? Any more? <clears throat> Is that it? Uh, Bobby, Alex, any more question? Say again. No, I think there's no, no more questions. That's all, is it? Okay. So. So. Yeah, um, would you like to share Mary's uh, inspirations? Uh, I'll do it. Oh, you do. I'll do it. Uh. Oh, you do it. Uh -huh. So, thank you for being here, and uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next time again. Uh, so whatever. Whatever endeavors that you are going through, may you all be free from all kinds of harm and danger. May you all, may you all be happy, healthy, and be safe wherever you all are. We share merits. Idang me punyang, nibanasa, pachayo, hotu, hotu. May my, men, may my merits be a condition for the realization of Nibbana. Imang no punya bagang sabasatanang dema. We share these merits with our departed ones, with all beings. And all the devas. Sabe Sata Suki Hontu Anumo Dantu. May all beings be happy. May they rejoice in these merits. Sadhu. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Bhante, for the wonderful sharing. So next Sunday, we have uh, Acham Brahmalihi at 9 o'clock. So 